Okay, hopefully you guys played around a little bit, right? Um, I should add, I, I don't know, at the bottom there's a cell on a different kind of architecture which is called a convolutional neural network, all right? You can go look up what it is, all right? And the basic idea is now I do image filtering, these tend to work better, but the point is like, look, I, you have to go Google, <laughs> you have to read. Um, even, even if you don't want to do that, you'll see that in this thing you opened up, if you go back here, you'll see there's all these notebooks I wrote, um, right? And they have different kinds of things, right? So here's a, you know, here is a different thing with a SUSE data set, right? And you can, you can just go through and play, right? But what I just want to show you is that it's not that hard to write this code, right? At least initially to start playing. And it's really, you have to play. It's a numerical experimental field. It's an empirical field, right? The best thing you can do is re-implement papers you read. So it's not that hard. <laughs> Open it up. The documentation's amazing. You can usually find the answer to Google on Google of lots of stuff. But then you will also get confused. It's like all coding. There's some shape that doesn't agree. There's some funny little code thing you got wrong. You try So always, whenever you take some code, try to change it. And you'll find that you break it quickly, and then you don't understand, and you go back. You know, it's the usual thing. It's, re you know, it's empirical, numerical co conversations, uh, things. So in the last you know, five minutes I have in this lecture, I just wanted to tell you what how you should really understand how you built something, right? And this is really, um, this is really the deep learning workflow, I would say, for most problems. So what you do is, the first thing you wanna know is how good can you do anyone do on that task, right? So you have some task, which is classifying something, and you wanna establish, is my neural network close to being that good? or bad at something, right? So for example, and this is called finding an optimal error rate or establishing a Bayes, Bayes error rate, right? So you wanna know what's the best you could do on a task because you wanna have some metric for establishing how close your model is to the best you could do. And the best thing you should do is usually ask a bunch of experts or something like an expert that says what's going on, right? So a lot of deep neural networks is about automating things that humans can do very easily. Right? So you ask, how good is this? What's the best I could do? Right? And then what you do is there's two things that can happen. You're either overfitting or you're underfitting. Right? And this is going to be the theme of the next thing, too. You don't have to take pictures. It's in the review. Go read the review. All these figures are straight from my review. <laughs> Our review. It's not just my review. A lot of people worked very hard on that review. I should stop saying my review. I don't mean to usurp credit in any way. <laughs> um, though I did, wa I mean, I used to say I wasted my whole sabbatical because I thought it would take me a month and it took me 11 months to write. And even then I couldn't finish it and everyone helped me on that review so much. But enough people have told me they found it useful that I feel less bad about doing that with my whole sabbatical. So, um, so if the training error is too high, that means your model's not complicated enough. That's called underfitting, right? Your bias is too big. So what you should do is you should either need to train longer, you need a new model architecture, or often what's missing from all this is data. You might not just ha might not have enough data, right? You might need to get more data. If the training error is not high, then the question is, is the validation, and validation is like a test set but it's not a test set because you're never allowed to tune anything on the test set. So what you do is you take your training data set, you divide that into a training data set and a validation data set. And the validation data set is like a test set, uh, which I use to tune hyperparameters, architectures, things like that. Right? If I'm going to change anything, I can't use the test set. The test set is after I'm all done. I declare victory, then I can check what I did on the test set. I can't check what I did on the test set before that. So if I have to change hyperparameters, change stuff, I have to make like a separate, what I call a validation test set, which is like a test set that I change, use to change things. 
So now if the validation error is high, but the training error is low, that means you're overfitting, right? You're fitting weird things in the training data set that are not generalizable. So that means you have to regularize more, or you need more data, or you need new model architecture or something until, and you need to keep on going here, right? So this is basically your model's not expressive enough. This is your model, you're overfitting, so you have to regularize. This is basically a mismatch between the training and test error. And then if that's done, then you're done, right? That's basically the workflow. So this is all hyper, and then often you have to tune so many hyperparameters, right? Each of these errors is actually training lots and lots of models with different hyperparameters, changing stuff around. And that's why it gets so computationally expensive. That's why you hear numbers like it took $30 million worth of extra, you know, uh, you know, electricity to train, you know, whatever, the open AI, whatever the new thing is, I don't know, whatever they are, like, you know, all these things, right? 40 million. It's because you can't, you're not just training it once. If you were just training it once, you'd be okay. It's because you have to try a million different architectures, a million different hyperparameters. You have to do all this stuff, right? And often you can have the right idea, but you have the wrong hyperparameter, and then you think it doesn't work, but it is actually the right idea. So it's really just, you have to, you have to play, right? And the last thing I want to emphasize is that there's lots and lots of examples, right? Even if I just go to Keras, so these are examples of things you might want to do, right? So here is image segment, you know, so, and what's nice about all these is they have less than 300 lines of code. And you can see how much you can do with 300 lines of code. So for example, here is a neural network that learns how to segment images, right? All, it takes as its input is a picture and an output is the outline of the object you want to do, right? And then you have to come up with a loss function, right? So now I say, oh, I'm gonna, so now the neural network is designed to take an image, put an output, and now you have to come up with a loss function. So you have to decide, how am I going to measure the loss between what the neural network outputs and what this outputs, right? So often use, I don't know what they use in this particular thing. There's a very prominent architecture that's become very popular for doing this kind of thing, which is called UNET. You can just go read about it. You don't have to build, if you're just applying pre-existing methods, you don't have to build them off the shelf, right? So in biology in the last three, four years, like it's, it's hilarious, it's like the rest of biology. Three years ago, you could get a nature paper or nature communications paper with a UNET thing, and now everyone has a UNET, right? Whatever. <laughs> but my whole point is you shouldn't be scared. So it's 300 lines of code, right? This is all it is. Right, and and um, and again, I can tell you what the output is because I can read this thing. It looks like the way they're putting an output is soft max. So they're saying this is the probability of being the output, and they're using cross entropy to do this thing. Right, so I can just look through, do this. There's much more complicated stuff. Right, so uh, let me see. Well, you can just go through and look at all these things, you know, and. And, and these are like, you know, pretty com these are pretty complicated stuff, right? And you can do it all with 300 lines of code. The other thing I should point out that I didn't have a chance to talk about is computation matters. Everything is faster on GPUs, but actually coding for GPUs in these libraries is trivial. It's usually just a flag. Just say GPU true. <laughs> all right. So back in the day, it was really hard to do this, and now it's trivial, essentially. Um, so using, so I think this is going to be an important tool in everyone's toolbox. Going forward, I don't think, you know, I'm not one of these people who thinks like deep learning is going to put science out of business. I mean, I don't think it has that capability any more than like linear algebra has the capability of putting science out of business. But we know linear algebra is useful, and we know this is going to be really useful going forward. So you should just... The sooner you familiarize yourself with these things, the better it'll be for you. All right, so I think that's all I want to say about this. And in the next lecture, I'm gonna do some more theory. I'm gonna do, there's only so much basic stuff I can do. So I'm gonna give you a research talk, mostly because I'm not gonna be here next uh, 
next week because I have to go back and teach back in Boston. So um, I'll tell you something about bias invariance and double descent in neural networks. That's kind of interesting. At least we're really proud of it. We're really proud of these papers we're going to talk about. Okay. So see you in 15 minutes, I guess. Uh, any questions? No? The notebook answered everything? <laughs> All right. So we'll see you back here at uh, 11 o'clock.
All right, we get started with lecture four by Professor Mehta. I don't know. Maybe I just put it here. <laughs> Hope for the best. Can people, is it coming through? I don't know. If no one complains online, I'm not doing anything. It's OK? All right. Um, um, good. So. In the last hour I have, I thought we'd go beyond something basic and tell you something that I, I don't know, our, I was, I've taught this, I, I, this research actually came out of the fact that I taught this class many, many times. And at some point when you teach things enough, you realize you're saying lies. <laughs> it's been my constant, uh, and then you ask people around and you realize everyone is saying lies and some people realize they're lying and other people don't. Um, the more you teach StatMax, the more you realize that you lie a lot. <laughs> StatMax is, uh, Stat is mysterious. Um, but um, so I'll tell you about something that we did. Um, this is really work that was done by um, Jason, who's a postdoc in my group. It's based on a couple of papers, this physical review research. We originally sent it to PRX and had the most Longest, most aggravating review process ever. <laughs> it was kind of fun. It was kind of a, it was a kind of a, it was sociologically interesting, except for the fact I think it was so annoying for Jason that he's going to go, he's probably going to leave academia, even though he shouldn't, and go join some startup where he'll get paid like four times as much. So in that sense, I regret that process. But in every other sense, it was kind of amusing. Um, but anyway, the paper is really good. We're very proud of it. We're proud of this work. We think it's really good. I think it's one of the best papers to come out of the group in the last couple of years, so I'm happy to share it. And the bulk of this work was done by Jason. All right, so let's start with what I always learned as a physicist, right? Which is, I learned this quote from von Neumann, which said, with four parameters, I can fit in an elephant, and with five, I can make him wiggle his trunk, right? And this is just like a funny, you know, little paper from the American Journal of Physics where they amusingly, like, you know, make that, make a stupid model where you can make that happen, right? With four parameters or five parameters, they make a trunk wiggle. It's just to tell you that the received wisdom until like 10, 12 years ago is you should never have a lot of parameters. That parameters are bad for you, right? Because you're going to end up overfitting. So, the central mystery of machine learning, I would argue, on a theoretical level, or one of the central mysteries, I would say to me, there's two central mysteries, um, is why can ML, one of the central mysteries is why can machine learning make good predictions despite having so many parameters? Right? So for example, here's ImageNet, which now is no longer state of the art. Now it's considered a medium-sized data set. It was considered impossibly hard five years ago. Now it's medium sized, just so you know the pace at which machine learning goes. Right? It's 1,000 classes, 1.2 million training images. Right? So medium sized data set. And, you know, it, and the categories are pretty hard. So here's like different kinds of cats, here's different kinds of dogs. And this is basically, you know, how well people did on ImageNet. And this is how many computational unit, uh, resources it took, operations in giga, gigaflops. And this is top 1% accuracy. And you can see AlexNet basically beat everything else in 2012. It was down here in like, you know, 1940. And it just keeps getting better and better and better and better and better and better, 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 right? And this is only up until like 2018. But what I want to point out is that the number of parameters here it's 5 million to 155 million parameters. But we have 1.2 million training images. And I think 
the question is, you know, there's something wrong between this von Neumann quote and the empirical thing that's been going on. And I think a lot of people were thinking about this. We all, anyone who had thought about this for like half a second was like, what's going on? But I think it, you know, oh, right? Uh, but, you know, again, we'll come back and think about how simple an example, you know, a simple example of polynomial regression. Because this is where all our, you know, intuitions were developed, right? And unlike, um, unlike the example you guys did, this is polynomial regression over the Legendre polynomials, just so we're clear. Right? It's not polynomial regression over x, x squared, x cubed, it's the Legendre polynomials. It's not really important for most of what we do, but you might as well know. So how complicated a model should we use, right? And this is like somehow just a review of what we already did. Right? That's why I feel comfortable giving this. Which is that, you know, here is my true mop, true function, just so we're clear. Right? Here's my true function. Here's my training data. As you'll see, there's noise. And what do I do? Right? So you know, I can start with like a very simple model with a few Legendre polynomial. This is what I get. So the red are test data. And I can calculate the training error and the test error. You see this is what happens. And I can just keep increasing the complexity. Right? This is, you guys did this exercise. But this talk is not for people who have been set up to do this. But this is why it works particularly well. So I make it a little bit more complicated. And look, you know, it's the same thing that happens. The training error and test error both go down. I make it even more complicated. And look, at some point, I can exactly fit the training data, but my test error gets really, really big. We just we, we saw this earlier in the lectures. So this point, where the training error goes to zero, is going to play a central role in everything I tell you. All right. So at some point, there's going to be a point where the model is so complicated, I can get zero training error. And we're going to call that the interpolation threshold. So again, this is the classical statistical intuition has always been the optimal complexity is some intermediate level here, where the training error is not zero. But I have basically have this kind of you know, trade-off. Because here I'm overfitting, here I'm underfitting. And the optimal thing is right here. So as we discussed earlier, right, the way we like to think about this is that we like to decompose the test error into three components, a bias, a variance, and a noise. And the bias is the tendency to underfit. right? It's the inability to express relationships underlying the data. And so the bias in this regime basically goes monotonically decreasing with model complexity. All right. The variance is the tendency to overfit. Memorize details of the training data that are not general. For example, noise. And the variance tends to go up. Because as I make the model more and more complicated, I need more and more data to train it. And so what happens is that here I've made the model too complicated for the amount of training data I have. So I'm fitting all these fluctuations from sampling. Everyone OK with what's going on? So this is bias, and this is variance. Okay. So this is, I would say, until four or five years ago, maybe three, four years ago. I don't know when. But there was a series of papers, one from Ben Reck group and then from Michael Belkin's group that basically pointed out that this picture can't be very complete, right? So again, bias is the tendency to underfit. So this kind of polynomial can't express this complicated relationship. Variance is the tendency to overfit. So here I've you know, put, fit all the training data points, which are in blue. But obviously, I'm fitting random fluctuations. I'm not expressing everything that's going on. So. The question is, really, we come back 
And it seems like these kind of models are just defying this thing, right? So naively, you're like, OK, maybe it's not true. You try to make stories about why classic bias invariance still works. But these numbers are suggestive of something really bad going on, like something fundamentally different. And I think this, yeah, go ahead. Please interrupt. It's because, uh, it's because um, the variance is basically what overfitting is. Overfitting is variance. They're the same thing. Because overfitting means that I, I'm sampling from the real distribution, right? But I am, my model, the more expressive my model is, the more parameters it has, right? Think about the polynomial regression here, right? The other, this model just never has enough parameters to fit all the fluctuations in the training data, right? I have the same amount of training data points. One, two, three, four, five, I don't know. I'm not going to count them, but there's like 15 training data points or 20 training data points. But this model doesn't have enough parameters, so it doesn't overfit because it can't fit all these things. But this one, because I have so many free parameters, it can just make all these wiggles. And that depends on the amount of training data, right? No, the bias means if I had an infinite amount of data, it shouldn't be going to 0 here. Maybe that's what's confusing. It shouldn't be going to 0. Yes, it's not the variance of the data. It's the variance of. <laughs> There's many ways to think about variance. One way of thinking about it is that if I had many different data sets of the same size, how different would the model parameters be? Yeah, yeah, but, but, but like variance is, variance is a hypothetical quantity that says if I had many different data sites. So like the point is, right, here, if I had slight, if I drew different training data points, again, they would look slightly different, and this function would look completely different. And I did it again. This function would look completely different. This function would look completely different. So that's why there's so much variance. Because these blue points would move around, and this thing would just adjust itself to do it. So every, for every data set, it would be very different. Whereas this function, where is it? Uh, oh, I'm in the wrong direction. This direction. This function, on the other hand, uh, I'm still in the wrong direction. This function, on the other hand, it won't care. I move these blue points around, it doesn't care. It's still going to basically do the same thing. So the variance is low here. Right? Every time I do it, if I give it a different data set, it's going to basically look the same. So that's basically why it's the same picture. And that depends, of course, on the number of model parameters I have. Uh -huh. So that's why the variance goes up here, and the bias goes down. OK. So I think the moment people realized they couldn't ignore this anymore was this very famous paper from Ben Rex group Right? Um, and what they showed was that they took uh, modern neural networks. And what they did was they basically showed that even if I randomized all the labels or shuffled all the pixels or made random pixels or added Gaussian noise to everything, if I trained long enough, I could get zero training error on all the neural networks people use. So they're expressive enough to capture relationships of random data in high dimensions. So we must be fundamentally missing something. Right? So that's, that was the interesting thing. And then after that, people started wondering what's going on. And then there's 
there's been a flurry of papers about all this stuff, right? And I would argue that I'll show you a simple example that tells you that it has nothing to do with random neural networks at all, right? So I've never seen anyone write this example down. Me and Jason constructed it for our talks. I kind of feel like we should just write this down in some paper to show people how simple it can be, all right? So here's the same thing, right? Training data points 25, fit parameters 25. Now what I'm going to do is in this simple polynomial regression, I'm just going to keep on increasing, all right? Now look what happens. I increase the fit parameters to 50, and all of a sudden, my test error goes down. Nothing complicated. Not a deep learning model. <laughs> Nothing complicated at all. Polynomial regression. <laughs> Keep on going. 100 fit parameters. Oh my god, it's doing even better. And the basic idea was that this was first pointed out. You'll see like two, three years later, Michael Balkin's group basically pointed out that this should probably be a generic property of many models. Right? So you did it with random forests. You did it with these other things. Nice work, really nice work. Right? And they, now there's like a small zoo of paper. I mean, not small zoo, a large zoo you know, of, of papers. It's like the San Diego Zoo of papers thinking about this. So I must say, I, I, I have a hard time extracting uh, intuitions and information out of them. <laughs> so you have this crazy thing. This is polynomial regression. So we just didn't get statistics right. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's a great question. So he's asking, if I have many more parameters than data points, how do I do this? So these are just min-norm solutions. So we don't even do gradient descent. I just want to point out in this paper, in what I'm going to tell you, everything we do, there's no gradient descent. And it's a quasi-convex problem, meaning that once you require minimum norm solution, meaning that you just choose the thing that has the minimum norm. It's pseudo-inverse. I use pseudo-inverses for everything. Right? Regression. The only problem is that I can't take an inverse. So I can replace it with a pseudo inverse. That's like saying setting everything to zero that I can. So that's how I do it. I just do pseudo inverse min norm solutions. Everything's convex, no SGD, nothing. It's convex once I tell you it's pseudo inverse, it's a unique solution. So the simplest setting you can imagine. It's nothing complicated. <laughs> and that's how you do it. It's a great question. <laughs> I should have said that, but I just didn't. <laughs> All right, fun. So we wanted to understand. So a lot of people have done this, but we like these concepts. So we wanted to understand what the hell is going on here. And it was especially confusing because many of the people from physics, you know, Montanari, Italian, Paris, Sting Las Mafia, as I like to call them. Um, uh, um, they had done a lot of calculations, and they didn't all agree with each other. And we were very unhappy because they also didn't. They had a lot of replica calculations and not a lot of intuition for our liking. So we just wanted to understand. So like a lot of papers I'm proud of, it's because I didn't understand what was going on, and we wanted to understand it for ourselves. So I'm going to tell you about how we thought about this. And we did do all the calculations with a different way, right? And um, so this is a long tradition, right, of studying these kind of models in statistical physics, spearheaded by this <laughs> aforementioned <laughs> Italian and French statistical physics community who've really been at the forefront of all this, really doing great work. So and the paradigm they usually think about, you know, along with, you know, Haim and Daniel Amit and all these kind of like Israeli, that whole school of people is what's called a teacher-student model setup. Right? So we again, 
we, you hear a lot of stories about why this is happening and why this isn't happening and how complicated things have to do. So we wanted to make the simplest model we could so we could understand what's going on. And so what we did was, I'm not going to show you any of the math. There's going to be no math in this talk, essentially. But I show you there's a 40-page su supplementary information, and we had to split our paper into two papers <laughs> because it was too long originally. Right? So there's 40 pages plus another 15-page paper. <laughs> so there's a lot of math behind all this stuff. But the math isn't interesting to me. What's interesting is the intuition, really. <laughs> so the basic idea is we have a teacher model. right? So this is how we generate the data. So the data is generated by some function plus noise. Right? And in the teacher, we're going to choose these features and these parameters to be random vectors. And for most of the stuff I show you, I think this is just going to be a linear function. All right? And ignore all this stuff. That's all normalizations to make all the calculations work out. But it doesn't really matter. It's just basically a linear teacher model. All right? And these, it's just to remind you, these are random vectors. I'm normalizing by some standard deviations. I'm normalizing by this f prime, because it makes some integral notation. It you know, saves you like 30 lines <laughs> of notation later on. But it's not really important for all this stuff. So it's just a function. And then I'm going to teach, I'm going to fit it with a different model, which is called the student model. And we're going to consider two models. One is just linear regression, which is, which is also called ridge regression, ridge-less aggression, where I just you know, have each thing, and the output is just a weighted thing. And then I'm also going to consider essentially kernel regression or a two-layer neural network, if you want it to sound sexier, <laughs> where the inputs get transformed through some middle layer, a hidden layer, with some arbitrary nonlinear function, phi. And these parameters, w, are drawn randomly but are fixed. Right? So it's just a random kernel. And then I train the output layer. So I train these parameters right? from a hidden layer. So I just introduced one hidden layer with some random matrix, random stuff in there. Right? It's very simple. So it's just kernel regression. Questions? Good. All right. I'm going very slowly, but slowly is better than anything. All right. So what you can do is you can calculate a bunch of stuff. So these white line, these black lines are all analytics, right? So we do cavity method. We do it. I'm pretty involved. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and you can calculate test error, training error. These things actually have error bars, but you can't see them. It doesn't matter. <laughs> all this stuff. And what you see for this model is that you see what happens is the test error kind of diverges at this interpolation threshold, and then comes back down, and the training error goes to 0 exactly here. And the important point we're going to have in all this stuff is that there's going to be three, things, three ratios that really matter. There's going to be the number of parameters, which is the same as the number of things in the hidden layers, NP, number of features, which I'm going to call NF, and the number of training data points, which we're going to call n. Right? So there's, there's just basically three, three, three things that matter. And as is usual in all this, for the experts in the audience, there's at least a few I know. This is the usual, we play usual tricks. nf, number of features, input features, number of parameters, m. We send all three of them to infinity. And we hold these ratios fixed. thermodynamic tricks that you use in all these things. If that didn't mean anything to you, then just ignore this. <laughs> all right. And we also assume replica symmetry. Yes? Yes, that's, that's, that's going to turn out to be the fundamental trade-off. The fundamental trade-off is going to turn out is nothing about statistical fitting, but it's going to be about resources, which is consistent with what we understand about modern neural network. 
Nothing is for free. Yeah. Related to what? What's related to what? Yeah, yes, it's a second order phase transition. You can show it's a second order phase transition. It's a classic second order phase transition. You can calculate it. I'm not going to talk about it. It's all in the paper. Second order phase transition. All right. So, so we can calculate test and training errors, right? And these models behave slightly differently. All right. So for the two-layer neural network I already showed you, this thing diverges, this interpolation threshold, and then comes back down the error. Training error goes to zero. Ridge regression, notice that I can't change the number of features and the number of parameters are the same thing. Right here, I can change the number of parameters independently of the number of features by just increasing or decreasing the hidden layer. Here, I can't. So when I change the number of parameters, I also change the number of features. And what happens is, again, you get a divergence of the test error. It comes back down, but then it starts increasing again. So that's rich regression. But remember here, this means slightly something different, because I can't change the number of parameters without also changing the number of features. So here, I'm changing both the size of the data and the number of parameters, whereas here I can fix the size of the data and just change the number of parameters independently. That's the fundamental reason these things behave differently. And we'll see what happens. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. This stuff. <laughs> if you want to know how to do it, they're pretty fun. They're pretty, but they're, they're pretty involved calculations. It's pretty fun. <laughs> um, so the next thing we asked is can we say something about the bias and the variance of these models? All right. So it turns out, for whatever reason, people who should know better in previous works have defined bias and variance wrong. Just completely wrong. And they give nonsensical answers. So if you define bias and variance right, it's part of why we had a very long referee process. <laughs> First, we were told we were wrong. And then we were told we were irrelevant, which is pretty much the difference was irrelevant, which is pretty much how it goes, right? Um, <laughs> um, so if you look at the bias and variance, that's plotted here. Remember, we can decompose the error into bias, variance, and noise. And what you see is that these transition, the variance in ridge regression, the variance diverges. The bias is 0, but then actually increases. And the error in this linear regression model is because the bias is 0 here. So remember, I'm generating the data with a linear model. I'm training it with a linear model. At this point, the number of parameters is less than the number of training data points. And then here, the number of parameters is bigger than the number of data points or the number of features. And what you see is here, the bias goes up. And that's why the error goes down. And the variance does this thing where it goes diverges and comes back down. In this two-layer model, I'm training with a linear data. And then this is a nonlinear model. And the bias just keeps going down, 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 and goes, approaches 0 monotonically. But the variance, again, diverges at the interpolation threshold. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll come to it. The whole talk is explaining the curves, <laughs> right? I just want you to know what the phenomenon is. Yeah, that's the whole talk. That's the next 30 minutes. How do we intuitively understand this, right? Because I think these are actually the right curves. Let me put it that way. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to explain. The whole talk is explaining these curves. <laughs> It, it is. We haven't done the calculations yet, but it's basically the same thing. You can do the calculations. So I have one question. Though. If the variance remains the same for the way the model is run, then uh, how is the reason for parameter is not negative? I use minimum norm. I do pseudo inverses. So remember, this is, look, 
look at, think about the setup. I just want to emphasize how simple this is. We're only training this top layer, so this is just regression. It's just regression with a kernel, random kernel. Regression, I know I can find the solutions, right? The solutions are easy. There are just x transpose x pseudo inverse x. So this is the min minimum norm. So usually if it's full rank, I just put inverse. Instead I put, I might have the transposes wrong, but you know, roughly speaking, there's a pseudo inverse here. So that's all I do. So that's like min norm solution. It's the same thing as saying I'm doing ridge regression, but I'm sending the ridge parameter to 0. That's the same thing as a pseudo inverse. It's ridge less regression, they call it, in statistics. If you know what ridge regression is, I'm not sure. But I'm just replacing this with a pseudo inverse. That's the only thing I'm, trick I'm doing. Where? Uh, it's just a normalization. That's just the noise. It's not really important for anything. I don't, I don't know what lecture notes you're talking about. I promise you this is 100% right. <laughs> I don't know what people are saying. I'll just say there's a lot of wrong results floating around. <laughs> I am 100% confident in this thing. Okay, you should never be 100% confident, but whatever the significant digit where you can't tell the difference between 100 and 99 point whatever, 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 we're confident. <laughs> All right, so the whole point of this curves is to explain this. Why does the variance diverge and then come back down? So strange. Why are you less sensitive to sampling noise once you have more parameters? Weird. And why does the bias behave these different ways in these two models? Right. This is what you'd normally expect the bias to just go down, 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 down as I make the comp model more complicated. But here you get something different. All right, again, this is just the same graph again. U-shaped, so this is, this is what we classically always thought about, right? So I just want to point out, this was the curves we've been drawing, the left-hand side of this thing. What's funny is you extend this thing, and this is what it looks like. Right? So both bias and variance decrease in the overparameterized regime for this nonlinear model. Right? And the point is, this error is the sum of these things plus noise. <laughs> there is no trade off there? Yeah, yeah. There's no trade off there. There is a trade off, which was already raised computational costs. But there's no trade off in the statistical sense. All right. To understand this, we're going to have to think a little bit about some intuition. So I'm not going to show you any math. Just intuition from now on. So as I said, you could think about all these models as I make a prediction. I have something that takes the input features, transforms them to the model features. right? So it just take the x, transform it, fit it. And now I can, what I can think about is I can think about decomposing this matrix ZZ transpose. Right? And that's just like how the model sees the data. What are its principal components? Everyone here, who here, does everyone here know about PCA? Who doesn't know about PCA? OK, don't be shy. So PCA, this is a standard thing. It's called PCA. And what happens is that if I have some data, and I want to know, I want to make figure out what happens is the data is high dimensional. What I can do is I want to know in which direction is it varying the most. So what I can do is I can calculate the correlation matrix between all the data, diagonalize it, and the eigenvectors are what are called the principal components. And the eigenvalues, 
tell you. So the eigenvalue, if I take the correlation matrix of any data set, the eigenvalues tell you how much the data vary along the eigenvectors. So I have some data. Like, the basic idea is just this. Um, I have some data. Right? So imagine I have two-dimensional data, and it's a blob. But it's like a blob that's like you know, an ellipse. Most data is an ellipse. What the principal component tells you is that it goes to this diagonal direction, to this eigen direction of the ellipses. And the eigenvalues, lambda, tell you how much variation there is along this direction. So the eigenvectors correspond to the directions the data is extended. And the eigenvalues tell you how, much, how extended they are in those directions. And so now what I can do is I can look at this not in the original feature space, but in the space of the models. Right? This is how the model views the data. Z is how the model views the data. Everyone understand that? Right? If I go back to this thing here, this picture here, the model only views the data through this layer Z. Right? It doesn't have access to all this stuff. So this is how the model views the data. And I'm going to ask, in the viewpoint of the model, how is the data varying in different directions? Okay. And the important point you should take away is the larger the eigenvalue, the better sampled it is. Because the eigenvalue tells you how much variation there is in that direction. Okay. So there's two different ways of thinking about this thing. So what I can do is, again, I have the fit parameters. I have the model features. And now what I can ask is, let's look at the spectrum of these features, these directions. Right? The spectrum tells me how well sampled I am. So if I'm in the underparameterized regime over here, what you see is that I can look at the eigenvalues, and they're all very far away from 0. They're all well sampled. All right? And in particular, there's a gap in the eigenvalue spectrum. All right? Everyone understand? Like the magnitude of the eigenvalue tells you how well you've sampled that direction. So here, there's no directions that I haven't sampled well. So the variance is pretty low. Now let's ask what happens as I come back. And I reach this interpolation threshold, what happens is actually the gap closes. And now the point is, I have all these kind of directions that I've sampled really poorly in the model feature space. All right? So I can't distinguish between poorly sampled features and well sampled features. And the point is that if I make predictions using these samples here, these directions here, then I'm going to make really bad predictions. Because those are not there in these directions where the eigenvalues are small. The training data is not representative of the real data because it's not sampled well. We'll come back to this in a second. Now the real miracle is what happens as I increase this thing, right? The real thing is, is that, and I'm I'm mixing up pictures for fairy tale telling, just so you know. This is not quite the spectrum. If you want to see the real spectrum, it's in the paper. This is for a simpler thing. This is the marchenko pasteur distribution. This is for the ridge regression. It's not going to really be important. You can do this for everything. But now the interesting thing is that as I go to the overparameterized regime, something else happens. Actually, a gap opens up again. So I get a bunch of eigenvalues at 0 which are the directions I haven't sampled at all. Right? Think about the rank of the matrix. I have more features than data points, so I have to have a bunch of zero eigenvalues. Those pile up here, but now the directions I did sample, I sample well. For those of you who know anything about random matrix theory, this is the marchenko pasteur distribution that we've shown here. <laughs> so. What happens is it's actually really easier to tell the 
directions I haven't sampled from the directions I have sampled. And so the variance goes down. Because I, can, I, I never have this thing where I'm mixing up things, where I can't tell if I've sampled the direction well or not. And this is basically generically what happens, right? So that was the spectrum you know, that I showed you for, you know, I showed you that. That was actually the spectrum I was, even though I had this picture here, this was for ridge regression. And this is what the spectrum we calculated analytically. It doesn't really matter. But the point is, the variance diverges because the eigenvalue goes to 0 at the interpolation threshold, meaning I have these very poorly sampled directions that are going on. And you can calculate all this analytically. It doesn't really matter. All right? Uh, right. Again, just emphasizing again, here it's really easy to tell the difference between things I've sampled and I haven't sampled. Here, impossible. So you can just actually explicitly check this. So what we can do is we can just look at the minimum component. We can take all the data and project it onto the component of z with the minimum eigenvalue. And what I've shown you here is that the orange is how that is the spread of the data in the training data set. And blue is the spread of the dating, training data in the test set, in, a big, in the true data distribution. And what you can see is here, the training and test set in the underparameterized regime basically look the same. The minimum eigenvalue doesn't look that different. But near the interpolation threshold, what happens is this is what the training data set <laughs> looks like. It's this orange line. And if I think about how I'll make predictions using that, it predicts that this is the relationship with this direction. But the test set is spread out like this, and the real test, real relationship is like this. Here they overlap. And now the interesting thing is if I go back here to overparameterize, again, the spread of the data is the same. I learned the proper relationship. So that's really why the variance goes up and down. All right? The last mystery is why does the bias go up here? Well, the answer is very straightforward. In this regime, because I've increased the number of parameters and the number of features, I have more parameters than data, or more features than data points, I always are going to have directions that I haven't sampled in the data. Right? There's feature. If I think about how many samples, I have this feature space, which is NF. And the whole point here is nf is bigger than m, the number of training data points I have. So for nf minus m directions, I haven't sampled those directions at all. So that means I, whatever predictions I make reflect whatever assumptions I had, I put in. So they basically reflect bias. And that's why the bias goes down. As I more and more. As, as I increase the number of features in the training data set while, hold, right, while holding the number of data points fixed, there's more and more directions that I haven't seen. And for this reason, you get more and more bias. Right? This is why the bias goes up. That's not true here, because I can change the parameters independent of the number of features. If I increase the number of parameters, it's not that I have lots of feature space that's unsampled. Right, that's, that's basically what's, what's going on. And you know, the last thing I want to point out is that there's another source of bias, which is that even if I don't have noise, it turns out if you do this whole analysis, bias models can interpret signal as noise. All right, so there's this, there's extra bias that comes in these overparameterized models. It's not really important for all this stuff. It's just a subtle point. I think it's already getting too complicated, so we'll, 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 we'll end it here. All right. So what are the four major lessons of our analysis? So that's basically our understanding of double descent, right? That there's two basic sources of bias in overparameterization. There's the usual source of bias that we always think about, which is that the model and the data mismatch. 
But there's a second source of potential bias, which is that I, if I'm overparameterized, I can have unsampled directions in the feature space. And this is going to introduce extra bias. Lesson two is that the variance comes from poorly sampled directions in feature space. Yeah. Oh, it should be unsampled. Oh, have you? So it's a good, uh, it's a good point. I should just fix it now before I forget. That's, it's bad when your typo actually becomes the opposite, <laughs> opposite meaning of what it's supposed to be. <laughs> there you go, unsampled. <laughs> Right? Lesson three, the variance, but not the bias, diverges at the interpolation threshold. There were a bunch of papers claiming the bias diverged. Right? And then finally, and this, I think this is the really thing, interesting thing. Interpolation is not overfitting. We can use many parameters when we can easily tell noise from unsampled directions. I apparently did not proofread this slide. <laughs> it's because I don't want to believe this because it's so weird. There. That's what I mean. Interpolation is not overfitting. All right? We can use many parameters when we can easily tell noise from unsampled directions. Basically, you just don't want to poorly sample stuff. And it happens that when the number of data points get close to the number where the training error goes to zero, by definition, that's when I have just enough parameters to barely sample all my data. That's what it means for the training error to go to zero, if you think about it. Training error is getting lower and lower and lower. Right when it hits zero is right when I have just barely enough parameters to do it. So I am not going to be sampling all the directions well. That's why there's always an eigenvalue that goes to zero. I don't know what you're saying, but we have all the order of limits, right? I mean, I. Yes, we do it for. I mean, we're doing a cavity calculation, right? We're doing a cavity calculation, right? So in the cavity calculation, you don't have to worry about all this stuff. In, I mean, I, well, there's, not, there's nothing wrong. There's a min-norm solution. The way you do it is you calculate everything with lambda finite and then set lambda to zero in the afterwards, which is the right way to do it. Yeah, I, I, I know. Yeah. I'm just asking, if this lambda is finite, then actually I would have thought in a box that my sample directions would be automatically yeah, you can. They are. They are. That's that's what ridge regression does, right? That, that, that's what it does. Yeah, I, I agree. Your intuition is completely right. So I'm trying to understand what one is going. Yes. Yeah. So if if I have ridge regression. Yes, you're right. Yeah, I agree. So so th that's the whole point. That's part of why people had such a hard time seeing this double descent. Because because if you regularize, this whole divergence goes away. It's exactly right intuition. Exactly right intuition. Your intuition is 100% right. Yes. So what happens is, to see this, you really have to turn off the regularization. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're 100% right. No, no, I was just trying to understand what you were saying. I was just uh, trying to understand. Sorry. I'm sensitive. I, I had eight referees. Seven? I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> I know. Yes, because it's the spectrum of the training data. So the, the, yeah, because the Z matrix, the Z matrix, right, is a matrix. Just think about linear regression. So it's something that has Z matrix is training data, number of training data points, right? So this is a matrix by number of model features. So each row of this thing is one training data point. NP, M by NP, which is the same as NF for ridge regression, but not for. Yeah, yeah, like, uh, can you comment on the discount 
it, it, it doesn't matter in what we do because in, in, in some sense, in some sense, we're working. If you want the, I don't know how familiar you're with the ideology of the field, but we're working in what you would call the NTTK limit because the kernel is fixed. We don't train the kernel, so there's nothing. So you can say in the, in so far as an infinite, if you believe the NTTK neural tangent kernel or whatever NTK, NT, I don't remember what neural, NTK, yeah, neural tangent kernel stuff, then this is like a neural tangent kernel calculation. But the other thing I should point out is it's lazy learning, right? So there's not even any feature learning going on here. It's the dumbest setting you can imagine. It's pseudo inverse, lazy learning, <laughs> nothing complicated. Basically almost a convex problem. Once you tell me it's the pseudo inverse, it's a convex, it's a convex problem. <laughs> No many minima, no none of this crap. <laughs> hey, none of the stories people tell. <laughs> yep. We don't train this. Yeah, here. If Yeah, there, it's always equal to one. Yeah, yeah, right. And that's why you can't increase the number of parameters without increasing the number of features. So that's why if I go this way, the bias goes up because not because of anything to do with the number of parameters, but it's because I can't sample the whole input feature space. What do you mean? It's just two different models. Yes, and they behave differently. huh? I'm not trying to compare them. I'm just saying there's different behaviors possible depending on what's happening. OK. <laughs> I, well, I can just tell you in the literature, no one got the bias right, even for the left-hand side model. <laughs> right? A lot of people were saying bias diverges at the interpolation threshold. I don't know. It doesn't matter. The intuitions are all I care about. That's fine. But it's still not clear why it diverges and comes back down in the first place. OK, you can say, OK, this is biased, but it's not clear why this should do this. Right? The whole point of double descent is that this minima is usually below here. But this is above. But it's still weird that there's a minima on this side. That's, I don't know. Maybe it's obvious to you. It wasn't obvious to us. I mean, the first people who did this calculation in some way were Andrew Saxon and Madhu Advani. Um, but it, you know, and like a lot of this spectral thing, it's hidden in their paper. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I was talking to them a lot when they were doing these calculations. Um, um, yeah, it is whatever it is. It's, it's, it's lots of people working on it. I'm just telling you, this is like, to me, I don't care about the math. I just care about the intuitions, and that's the intuitions we got. So I should point out, this is all lazy learning. This is all whatever it is, right? Yeah. 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 Basically, because we use min norm again, it's, it's just a regression, right, with a different basis. It's, it's exactly the same thing. It's just like you're basically going. I mean, you can go here and look at what happens. It's 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 literally that. The min norm solution <laughs> doesn't like to overfit because it doesn't need to use all those directions. It can easily distinguish the directions that are zero that don't have to be used from the directions that do have to be used. Right? There's this big spectral gap. So it learns very quickly, don't just throw away all the stuff at zero. The problem is, right? The problem is when gaps are closed. I don't actually have an easy way to tell what's important and what's not important. That's really basically all it comes down to. Once I know that I can throw away these things to zero, I know I should never use zero. That's what min norm does, right, in some sense. Min norm, pseudo inverse says, throw away everything that's zero. Right? It is linear. 
Yeah, I mean, one way of saying. OK, there's one way of thinking about it is this way. I do y is equal to z w, right, plus lambda over 2, whatever, norm w squared, like this. And then I send lambda to 0 at the end of all this thing. That's the same as taking a pseudo inverse. Because if I take a pseudo inverse, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. This is the cost function. <laughs> Thank you. I said lambda to 0. But that's the same thing. It's just the important point is that all that matters is the eigenvalues of ZZ transpose, but they come with a lambda. Okay, this, is, this is the important thing that comes in, in the bridge regression. It's in all regression. So now, if I have, you know, if these are all much, much bigger than lambda, then it's easy to tell 0 from non-zero. But if they're very close, then how do I know? But that's the essence of all this stuff. All the ses essence of it is, as I add more and more parameters, it's actually every direction that I do sample, I sample well. And the samples, uh, directions I don't sample well, it's pretty easy to tell them apart from everything else. That's essentially all. The Right, this is my cost function. So if I do this, this is a vector. This is my model features. And then I add a term, which is that the norm of the vector squared. And now when I look at ridge regression, the way it works is that ridge regression predictions go like the eigen, one over the eigenvalues of this zz transpose plus lambda. That's just, that's the, and the part that diverges, if you'll see in the test error, is exactly the fact that if I get a zero eigenvalue, you see your error goes to zero. So that's why normally I have to regularize. But if I know that all my things is finite except for 0, I just ignore the 0. But that's just basically what all these models are doing. This is generic. This is also why the basic intuition, understood instantaneously, <laughs> is that like if I put cut off, I cut off the divergence, right? Just cutting off the divergence. It's the only time my field theory training has ever helped me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that's it. That's basically, I think we're done early. I didn't want to, it's a long, four hours is a long lecture. So what I wanted to point out is this is, you know, what's going on. But there's many things we didn't put in the model. The main thing that I find interesting is we didn't put a lot of things in the model. We didn't put any fancy optimizers. We didn't put any fancy regularizers. We didn't even put feature learning in the model, right? I think that's the deeper thing. Deep learning not only you know, makes lots of parameters, but presumably those parameters learn useful and meaningful kernels, right? These parameters are adjusted to learn meaningful features. So that's, I think, the more interesting and harder thing about deep learning. How does, well, I don't know, more interesting, but it is kind of funny. So what I like about the work is it gives some intuition and it separates out what's necessary from what's not necessary to get the phenomenon, which I always find frustrating. Because people tell me I need A, B, C, D to get things, but what's the minimum setting? So that's, that's what I would say. And so, as I said, the work is Jason's. This is my current group. And all these people give me lots of money to think about, about stuff. So, well, mostly the NIH now. I wish the rest of them gave me money. I, I, I keep putting them on my slides in the hope they'll give me money again. <laughs> does, it, does that work? No, it doesn't work. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm trying to get more money from the Sloan. I'll let you know in a month. <laughs> All right. So let's thank Professor Mehta. And then give him a hard time with more questions. So, question. There's a notion of compressed sensing. Yes. Uh, where instead of rich regression, you use some, uh, I mean, L2 norm minimization, they use uh, L1 norm minimization and extract the uh, uh, feature vector uniquely. Uh, but the, the condition should be, the, the feature vector should be sparse enough. Yeah. And also, this matrix, your, your Z matrix, has to uh, satisfy some special condition. 
to uh, have uh, some, you know, the solution, unique solution, uh, I mean, in the, in the feature vector, unique solution, the condition should be, feature vector should be sparse, and in order for the feature vector to be determined uniquely, uh, this Z matrix has to satisfy some condition which is called so-called incoherence. Yeah, it's basically right. Yeah, something like that. So, so is it is this sense you know, notion of compressing anything to do with your your? Findings? Yeah. So the calculations that we do, the cavity calculations. Mm -hmm. So Anirban and Gupta basically did the same calculations for compressed sensing. Mm -hmm. You can reproduce all the phase diagrams. Um, yeah, the spectrum is the same. So I think in, if I, I could make the connection more, I mean, that's of course the point is that this is L1 norm and you're assuming something about PX right. being sparse. Um, you know, I think, I think, I think, you know, not really, I would say, you know, um, I think that is much more about the fact that if you put more assumptions on the data, so, so, so you when you increase stuff. the number of parameter, I guess the, the matrix, you, your Z matrix, becomes more and more sparse. No, I don't. I no. don't think the compressed. No, the Z matrix doesn't become sparse at all. It's not. It's not a compressed. Dimension of dimension of Z matrix becomes larger, right? Yes, but it's nothing. Like, yeah. I, yes, but the, but what really matters is the input data features. So, um, look, uh, it's it's a little bit more complicated. I don't try to show them. Complicated things, or because you said that the, if you increase the number of that, that, number that, of parameters, let me show you a full. Just let me show you a full phase diagram, and then it'll be. Then variance, uh, you know, you, you get more a better better result. So, so yeah, it's a little bit you. more. It's a little bit you know, it's a little bit more tricky than that, right? Uh, because it always is. Um, it's always a little bit more tricky than is let on in a talk. Right. Um, do we move all the phase diagrams out? Okay. Well, apparently we don't have all the phase diagrams. Um, okay. I, I can show you afterwards. It's a little bit more tricky, but it's not the compressed sensing transition at all. It has nothing to do with compressed sensing at all. Mm -hmm. Nothing. I mean, in, in so far as you can use the same, and you can see that because you can use the cavity method to analyze compressed sensing. This is a beautiful series of papers by Anurban. And, 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 and there's really interesting thing in the cavity system. There's relationships, but they're not the, they're not, the phase transitions are different. I mean, they're both second order phase transitions where the cavity susceptibility diverges, but that's just indication that it's a second order phase transition. But the nature of the transition is very different and the interpretation, I would say, is completely different. All right, other questions? Uh, thank you for the very uh, informative talk. Uh, so I would like to ask whether, I mean, my assumption is like all of this thing about double descent is about the supervised learning. Yes. Uh, is there any reason to expect that we have like something similar, you know, like more broader category of learning, like unsupervised learning, for example? Yeah, it's funny. We're funny. I would really like to understand how, what double descent, yes, I suspect it's true. How to define it is very hard. We don't even really know how to do double descent cal calculations properly for categorical data. It, it works roughly the same. We know it numerically does. Unsupervised learning, even the numerical experiments that definitively show it are not there. Because we don't know what overfitting means because we generally don't have metrics, right? You can see it. You can kind of see it, right? Like if you do image stuff, but it's hard because we don't have good metrics. No one can agree on what the metric for overfitting is. We know it exists. We know it when we see it, but we don't know how to quantify it well, or not in a thing. So, but I think that's one of the more interesting, it's one of the most interesting things to me. Like in unsupervised learning, what does overfitting mean? There must be something like double descent, right? How do we quantify it? How do we mean it? I, I don't know. I don't know. It's an open problem. I think, I think our best bet for that is RBM. So I think this is something to contribute. Um, I think there's interesting calculations to be done with changing the number of hidden layers and doing these things. We started to try to start setting them up, but honestly, sociologically, we got discouraged, so we we're working on other problems. We're, every, I, I dabble in machine learning every three, four years, and I'm like, why, do I, why am I in this hornet's nest? And then I just 
get out until I get interested because I feel like I don't understand something and I have to do a calculation. But I think they're really, if you want to work in machine learning, and especially theoretical machine learning and statistical physics, I think that's a great question. It's a really great question. And I think RBMs are the way to do it. Other questions? So uh, I think my, <coughs> my question is maybe similar to Professor Hyun's question. Uh, so, so the way you do some, um, something like interpolation is like that in the Blackboard. And, uh, that's and that's yes, the yes, the yes. So sort of the solution, and if we have many, uh, many parameters, uh, and if we consider the situation that the data is ex extracted extracted from um, the polynomial, and the fitting is done by the polynomial, yeah. then I think. The, yes, yeah. yes. It's a numerical experiment. Yes, and I think that the uh, parameters should be very sparse. No. Uh, no. Um, it's not a compressed sense equation. So, um, You're not sparse. And definitely not in feature space. This, in fact, the whole point is that to see this, you have to go to the PCA eigenvectors. You actually can't see it in the original feature space. You have to actually go to the PCA space and look at the minimum eigenvector, which is a collective mode. It's a collective mode phenomenon. Right? The whole point is that the eigenvectors are the collective modes. Right? They're the, and it's really in the collective mode thing and not in the raw parameter space. It's not, it's not sparsity. And compressed sensing is the opposite, right? Right? I mean, you can't, there is a way of, I don't know if the mathematicians have done it, but we have a way of looking at compressed sun. It, it, it's a little bit different, difficult because you don't know how to calculate spectrums, but there's a way to fake your way through a spectrum of compressed sensing. And you can see that what happens is it's similar in the sense that gaps diverge and things disappear. But I think that's just a general way of thinking about phase transition in these disordered systems. That's kind of fun. And, you know, and, and we see the same thing in ecological models, which have nothing to do with this. You know, we see phase transitions in ecology that are the same thing. We see the same thing in eco-evolutionary dynamics. So I think it's just a property of these disordered systems where you have very distributed degrees of freedom, but I don't think it's sparsity. I really don't, because it's about collective modes. Right? It's about minimum eigen a minimum eigenvector has nothing to do in the original basis with sparsity. Okay. I, I might be missing something, but I, I, I would be very surprised. Very surprised. Just numerically, you don't see it, right? So you can just, this is an easy experiment, right? Now you can go in one hour and do this in Python notebook. Just do the Legendre polynomials, and you can just look if it's sparse. It's not. It's, it's like a 30 minutes of code, right? <laughs> so, so in that case, is your red line has not sparse parameters, but but the tested line, the ground truth has, I think, the truth model has many sparse parameters. No. no? It has nothing to do with sparsity. I never have to assume sparsity. It's not compressed sensing. <laughs> okay. Just do the numerical experiment. I mean, I mean, it literally takes like, you know, 15 minutes. I, I don't know. You're a student, so it should take you like 20 minutes. It takes me like six hours because inevitably I have to like Google every error and forgotten every command. But you know, it's the good thing about being a student and not a professor. <laughs> right. Other questions? Uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I have a question that uh, actually I'm interested in the feature representation learning. Uh, this uh, this kind of neural tangent kernel style explanation is very interesting, but in practice, 
there are lots of neurons that are uh, that have a very low variance, which implies that some kind of feature are compressed. So I want to ask that there are some research that uh, connect between over parameterized regime and feature learning space. Yeah, I agree. That's the interesting question. But we, you know, we were trying to break this into bite-sized stuff. So the stuff I know, Heim, Heim's group has some papers. You know Heim, Kapolinski, Lenka, and Florent. Lenka, how do you say Lenka's last name? Uh, yeah. There you go, collective, and, and, and Boron, I can't say his last name either. <laughs> um, have some papers, I think, um, but I think it's, it's, it's underexplored. You know, I think there's three or four papers, I think they're good starts, but I, I think it's, it's the harder problem. But I, I wasn't even, I, you know, honestly, I, I, my confusion is often that everyone says everything is necessary for everything else, so I just like to break up into little pieces. This phenomenon requires this little part, so what do I get when I have feature learning that I don't get in lazy learning regime and things like that, right? So that's, that's, that's what I'm more interested in. But I agree with you, that's the interesting thing, right? Once I learned the kernel, what happened? And then there's also the training dynamics, right? We took all the training dynamics out of all this. There's no training dynamics. So what did the training dynamics get you? Then there's like the idea of how do different forms of regularization affect all this stuff. There's, you know, I, I feel like the form of regularization is much more important for the feature learning than it is for this lazy learning, is what I would say, right? Um, so I agree with you, that's the, in, that's the interesting thing. Uh, I, I, I'm getting more and more convinced that feature learning is not super important for a lot of the things neural networks do. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah. But you know, again, that's because I realized we got statistics wrong, right? We, I mean, by we, I mean collectively, we just don't understand, we didn't understand statistics right. Which is very surprising. <laughs> right? Thank you for the answer. Yeah. Other questions? No? Everyone's ready for lunch now. Anyway. Okay, let's start. Thank you guys for listening. And feel free to bother me. I'll be here the rest of the afternoon. <laughs>